Thank you for being here. I acknowledge that the city of Hamilton, where I record this podcast, is situated upon the traditional First Nations territories of the Erie, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas, and the Chonodon of the so-called Neutral Tribes. Hamilton is also directly adjacent to the Haldeman Treaty Territory. Hamilton is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and this land acknowledgement is a small gesture to recognize the rich history of this land and so that I can better understand my role as a settler, as well as a neighbor, partner, and caretaker. Miigwech. Thank you. Welcome to the arena, where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. For many, pregnancy and motherhood are a natural part of life. But for an increasing number of women, the process of becoming pregnant or having a child is not easy or straightforward. For any of my listeners who may have been through IVF, miscarriages, or the loss of a baby, this may be a difficult episode. My hope is that it also sheds some light on how we can best support someone grieving this kind of loss. Thank you for listening. This is episode 48. So I have to laugh because here I am in this lovely fuzzy sweater and you've got sh- shorts on because of course I know it's a different yeah. <laughs> different ends of the world. So yes. Gosh. So you had a bit of a busy morning. Yeah, so my daughter has her last day of school today before they close up for summer break. So then she's off until right towards the end of January. And my son's a childcare, so dropped her off, dropped him off. You know, it's just the chaos in the morning of, come on, get ready. Come on, what are you doing? Get ready. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> we need to leave. <laughs> mummy has got to work. <laughs> mummy has got to work. <laughs> so, yeah. But anyway, we got the, I got them out. They're, they're all at childcare at school, so it's fine. It's good. Very good. And on on our end, of course, we're moving into the winter holiday as opposed to the Mm. summer holiday. There you go. We've talked about the weather. Got all those things out the way. Exactly. I just wanted to say thank you again for agreeing to do this interview. We had a a very powerful conversation a few days ago and I've been reflecting a great deal since we chatted. And so thank you again. Absolutely. No, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. I've written my classic intro. It's rather lengthy, but I wanted to give listeners a bit of a context for your story, but lots of room for you to fill in the details of what you've been through. And so I don't mean to make it sort of skimming along the top, and that's not my intention to avoid um, some of the deeper issues, but also invite you to back away from anything where you might feel like it's taking you back into some very traumatic Mm -hmm. stories. Sure. You're free to go as deeply or as factually as you feel like you can. Niti Nataraja, you're a sister, daughter, and senior counsel at Philip Morris in Australia. You've been a lawyer for 18 years And you've worked in private practice in Australia and the UK and are now in-house at Philip Morris. You are the mother of four babies. You have a seven-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son. Between their births, you experienced the anticipatory joy of pregnancy and the very private devastation of miscarrying two babies. You had a thriving career. You and your husband wanted to start a family And you were blessed with a daughter, but looking back, you feel that you may have had a bit of postpartum after her birth. A few years later, you were pregnant with your second child, and you shared with your family and your daughter, who was three at the time, that she was going to have a baby brother or sister. Then you went for your eight-week ultrasound scan, and the look on your doctor's face told you something was wrong. It was a missed miscarriage. The grief and mental anguish of what you went through, I can't even fathom. You had to wait another eight or nine months before trying again. You became pregnant, though with much more trepidation. You were closely monitored, 
but then another missed miscarriage. And you were swept in the ocean of grief once more. You decided to try one last time, and your son was born, your miracle, your rainbow baby. After a long period of very private grief and silence about what you were going through, you are now sharing your story, knowing that there are so many women and families that suffer in silence, the shame, the guilt, the excruciating pain that they are trying to keep to themselves. And you hope to help others by sharing your story. And I have no doubt that you are very much helping others. Welcome to the arena, Niti. Thank you. It's lovely to be here, Linda. Thank you. I, as I said to you earlier, we really skimmed over the surface of where that story goes. I want listeners to get to know you a little bit better before all of this transpired. So what was dinner conversation like in your household? Yeah, look, growing up, my family is a very loving family and dinners used to be very much about sitting down together, no TVs on, just just us chatting and laughing and talking about the days. Inevitably, we would talk about school for me and my sister and what we'd done during the day. Occasionally, we'd talk about other family members who weren't at the dinner table with us and what was happening with them or with friends. And sometimes the events that were happening in the world, I think my views on how to treat other people and inclusion and respect have very much been formed from some of those conversations that I particularly had with my dad, not to say that my mum doesn't have similar views, but very much my dad was critical, I think, in the development of those sort of thoughts and feelings for me. And so we often would discuss events that were happening around the world, sometimes quite traumatic and tragic events mm. and our thoughts on those and and just some of the sadness with which you view some of the behaviour of people around the world in these sort of situations, yeah. You chose to go into law. Was there an influence from your family or was your father a lawyer by any chance? No, not at all. So I think my, my family being of from India, I grew up in mainly Australia but also in the UK a little bit and a few other places thrown in and in the mix. But <laughs> I, uh, so my family being from India, education is very important, like mm-hmm. critical. It's the one thing, actually, no, there are two things that families view as very important when it comes to raising children. One is education and the other is marriage, typically. And obviously with homosexuality becoming a little bit more accepted in India, that marriage concept perhaps is shifting a little bit, but it's still very important. But education is extremely important. And so from a very early age, my parents have drummed into us the importance of becoming educated, of being financially independent as women, and really being able to look after ourselves in the future. And so When I was at school, I was a high achiever. I used to get exceptional grades all the time. It was the thing that characterised me. It was my label at in my childhood was being intelligent. And so when I got my marks or when I was towards the end of school, I started second-guessing what I'd originally wanted to do. So originally I had the idea of doing commerce because I loved economics at school and I thought I can do economics at uni and I also loved languages and so I I studied both French and Mandarin Chinese Mm. at school and I thought you know what I can do that when I am in university so I can do commerce and arts and maybe that'll take me towards diplomacy or something along those lines I was never a science person. Like I could do it. It was fine. I used to get okay grades and everything, but it just wasn't my thing. And so I was like, okay, I've got to pick a humanities. And then my dad was like, you should pick law. And I'm like, I don't know anything about law other than what I've seen on TV. I don't know. And I was like, you know what? I really want to do the commerce. So this other thing is just an add-on. Okay, fine. I'll do law. 
And so I applied for law and with commerce and I got in. And at the time, double degrees in Australia were really common when you did law. Yeah, so that's how I ended up in the law. It wasn't intentional by any means. It was very much last minute. It's funny how things work out sometimes and you end up somewhere in life that you would never have imagined to begin with. So moving ahead, you've now got this career, you've gotten married and you're wanting to have children. And so your first pregnancy was seemingly smooth. You, you know, had no difficulty getting pregnant and, and, and have a beautiful daughter. So yeah. let's pick up the story from there. Yeah. So my pregnancy itself was really easy. Like it was fine. I didn't have morning sickness. I was, um, I was good. Just some of the usual stuff that goes along with being pregnant, cramping and pain and stuff and labor wasn't fun. But, but generally it was okay. It was good. And then I had her and we were in the hospital and she lost more than 10% of her birth weight. And mm. so when babies lose more than 10% of their birth weight, they term that as failure to thrive. And then they monitor the baby from then on in. And so all of a sudden it was pediatrician appointments and now we need to help you with feeding and what is going on. Why is this child losing so much weight? Why are they not putting on weight? And so it was hard. You've got a, a new child and you're adjusting to that. But in addition to that, there's this added pressure around feeding. And so I had to mix feed her from the beginning because of these failure to thrive issues so that the formula would help her put on more weight but then she would just scream at me like I, I would try and feed her and she would just scream for half an hour wow. and she would vomit straight after feeding and so I was a mess and then the pediatrician the nurses doctors were telling me you have to wake up in the middle of the night to feed her again you have to give her an extra feed at night and I was like I am breastfeeding, formula feeding, expressing. So literally I would feed her, put her down, express, and then within an hour she'd be up again for another feed. And so I was like, I'm doing that constantly. I have no time to do anything. And then I need to wake up in the night as well. So there was that. And then it was just really hard. There was so much going on at the time for me personally as well. And I was just, I think, going through the motions. Like I felt at times, what have I done? Why have I had a baby? This isn't what I thought it would be like. Do I really want this? And so I started second guessing everything. And the second guessing wouldn't last for very long because then I'd, you know, look at her and I'd be like, we, this is why I had you. You're beautiful, even though you do have these issues at the moment. And it's difficult to, like, in, in when you're a new mum, there are so many people giving you their opinion and you've got so much noise surrounding you. And I was like, through all this noise, I could tell something wasn't right with her. And I was like, there's something that's not quite right. And I... I went to the pediatrician in one appointment and said, I think she's got reflux because she's vomiting a lot. She seems to be in pain. I think she needs something to help her. The pediatrician was like, you know, it's not reflux. Went away again. And then we came back again. And I was like, I'm sorry. I really think it's reflux. I'm not coping with this. I need to try something. Can we try the medicine and see if it helps her and then go from there? And Eventually she agreed with me, okay, fine, we'll try it. And she was a different child. It oh was God. incredible the difference it made. And this was eight weeks in. So for eight weeks I've just been dealing with a screaming child, constantly screaming, losing weight, going to the hospital. Like we went to the Royal Children's Hospital, I think, twice at least during that time. We're at the pediatrician every few weeks. We're at the maternal health nurse. I was going to breastfeeding clinics. It was chaos. And so when I looked back on it after I'd gotten through this fog many months later, I was like, I was actually quite depressed at the time. I couldn't see it when I was there, but I genuinely do now think that at the time I was going through some postpartum, postnatal depression at the time, and I just I didn't have time 
to think about it. But it was beyond just fatigue for me at the time. I actually was mentally just sometimes just not there. Like I remember sitting there one day in my in the middle of the night in my chair, and she was just screaming. I just sat there, didn't do anything. I'm just sitting there. I, just, I can't comfort you. I don't know what to do. It's just literally just sitting while she screamed. And I look back at that now and I go, that was abnormal because if a child is screaming, normally you you reach out to comfort it. But I literally could not even do that at that point in time because I was so beyond overwhelmed with everything. And it took me a long time after that first year of her life to think about wanting to have another child. I always wanted to have another child because I have a very close relationship with my sister. Mm-hmm. But it took me a long time to go, I'm ready to go there again, because it was so traumatic for me. Oh, no kidding. And never mind the fact that you clearly were not being supported or listened to by your pediatrician regarding the Mm. the reflux. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, if there's one thing I say to mums to be now or parents to be, it's listen to your intuition and your gut, because there are so many people telling you, all sorts of different things for your child. Yeah. Listen to your body, listen to your heart. Mm-hmm. 100%. You ultimately, after some time had passed and with your desire to give your daughter a, a sibling, you decided mm-hmm. to try again and have a have another child. Yes, I did. And it wasn't hard. We got pregnant pretty quickly. So we were very excited. We were like, we've done this before. What could go wrong? So it was very much, oh, we'll tell my parents, uh, my husband's parents. We'll tell our daughter. She's been desperate to have a sister or a brother because she's at childcare and seeing all these babies. She's like, oh, what a baby. So we were like, okay, we'll tell her too. And so we did. We told her. And she was really excited and kissing my belly and talking to this little baby as a three-year-old does, right, in their gorgeous little half sentences and words that don't fully make sense. But So it was beautiful. And then we went for our eight-week scan and I was sitting there and I remember, I, was, I think I was talking to my husband at the time and we were laughing and really excited And out of the corner of my eye, I saw our OB looking at the screen as he was doing the ultrasound. And it's interesting. Sometimes you can tell from a person's eyes what's going on. And so I could see in a split second that the joy that was in his eyes two seconds before because of hearing us laughing and excited and everything else. And he was our OB with our daughter as well. So he'd been through that journey with us. The joy he had in his eyes disappeared and was replaced by an intensity instead. And in that moment, I was like, something is not right. And that was, I think, the moment my world started to fall apart. And I was like, what is going on? And then he said, I can't hear a heartbeat. And the fetus has not grown beyond, I don't know, seven weeks or something. And so that was traumatic. And it's, um, it's, it's really hard because I think from a medical profession perspective, OBs then start to tell you about, look, I'm really sorry, it just wasn't viable and it wasn't meant to be and there's this chromosomal issue and we think potentially or whatever. Anyway, so they try and explain it from a scientific perspective to you. You kind of know that there's always a risk of miscarriage with pregnancy. But I think once you've had one child, you start thinking it's not going to happen to me because I got through the first one, it was absolutely fine. And so at that moment, I was a mess. But immediately in my head, I'd started thinking, how do we get over this? <laughs> you know, and I was like, we're going to try again, we'll try again, we'll try again. And it was the one thing I was telling myself was, okay, this can get this is going to get me through the grief is the idea that after a few weeks, we'll try again. And hopefully we'll get pregnant again. And so this period can just be forgotten and put to the side. Mm -hmm. And because this is the way I'd I'd grown up was you didn't talk about stuff that was going on in your head. It just, you 
got over it. You dealt with it. You moved on. It wasn't something you openly discussed. And so I was like, okay, I need to get over it. And so we went away. My doctor told me to go away and let it pass naturally. And if it didn't pass naturally, to take some pills, which were abortion pills, as he called them. And I was like, I'm not aborting my baby. I don't have any issues with abortion, obviously, but it's that's not what's happening in this space. I want this baby desperately. I want to keep it. So that itself was traumatic at the time. So I went away and I then had to wait. So it was this waiting game of when will this baby decide to pass? And it was the hardest two weeks, I think, of my life literally just waiting and every moment of every day I was is it going to happen today is it going to happen now every time I'd go to the bathroom particularly at work because I really didn't want it to happen at work I was like oh my god is it going to happen now and it left me on edge for for that two weeks which felt like about five years but eventually nothing was happening so I took the tablets in the end and it was strange because it was cramping and it was reminiscent of the cramping that you get when you're delivering a baby. Not as bad, but similar because you're basically taking tablets that induce the delivery Mm -hmm. of the fetus. And so that was hard. It was really hard. And then I found out afterwards because we had to collect the fetus and they had to test it, which was a whole nother trauma in itself. But when they tested it, they found that it was what's called a molar pregnancy. And When you have a complete molar pregnancy, there's a risk of placental cancer. So they want to monitor the mother for quite a long time, particularly the HCG levels, um, which is the pregnancy hormone effectively. And so I had to wait for eight months, nine months before I could even think about trying again, which was not what I had planned in my head, because in my head I had planned one month, move on, try again but in the end up being eight to nine months. So it was very hard. I was counting the days. It was a very long eight to nine months for me. I I get this real sense of, I just want to move forward. Let's just put this behind us. And if I remember correctly, you didn't really share what was happening, people at the office or... No, I didn't. I did tell my boss and the only reason I told him, and I told him very briefly and didn't really talk about it much, but the only reason I told him was because the week after I found out I was supposed to go away, I was supposed to travel interstate within Australia and... I was like, I'd begged for this trip and I'd, I really wanted to go on it, but I was like, I can't go because I don't want to lose this baby whilst I'm away from everything. Yeah. everything. And so I had to tell him and it was really, it was strange. I literally beforehand prepared what I was going to say. I was going to, I was like, you have to get through this without crying. There's strange things that you tell yourself. And I look back at it now and I go, who was this person? Because it's not me now. But I was like, I cannot cry in this conversation. I need to go in and be matter of fact and say, this is what's happened. I can't go on this trip. And that's it. (laughs) Um, I got through about five words before I started blubbering. And and he was really good and he was very understanding of what was going on for me and, and was great. But that was literally the only conversation I had. I didn't tell anyone else. Um, at work. I did tell my sister and my parents and, and a few friends and had support from that perspective, but didn't tell many other people. And it was amazing, actually, when I told friends, the number of people that said to me, oh, I, I had a similar experience, or I had, you know, a miscarriage too, and it was really traumatic. And I was like, you're a really close friend. Why do I not know this? Yeah. There's some sort of little duck or something in the background that I can hear. I think it's like outside. A... Yeah. It's oh, bird. okay. <laughs> something you're like, oh my God. Okay. You're telling this really wrenching story. And just, whack, whack, whack. Anyway. Can you <laughs> yes, hear it? It's a bird outside. Yes, I oh. can now. It's a bird outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bloody kookaburra. <laughs> <laughs> that would be even worse. Then it would be laughing I whilst I was telling my story. <laughs> I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I thought if it's like no. some little child's toy or something and so let me put that away no it's uncontrollable because it's a bird outside <laughs> fair enough it's just very loud it's all right it's all right 
people shared that they had similar experiences. And yeah, it was nice to know that I wasn't alone by hearing these other stories. But it made me realize at that time how much I wished I'd known more before. Right. And it's not that you want to know everything about the trauma that it attaches to these situations or events, but I wished I'd known more. I wished right. I'd be less naive about the chances of miscarriage when you've had a child already, so secondary infertility. And it just made me think, why do people not talk about this? But then, you know, I still didn't talk about it at the time. I was just like, I'll talk to my friends about it, but that's it. But it did make me at the time just realise how little awareness and discussion there is about this. And I hadn't heard about a missed miscarriage until I had one. My idea in my head was that if I was going to miscarry, there would be blood and cramping and I would know it was happening because that's what the movies portray. That's what yeah. you read about, you hear about. You don't hear about babies just passing inside your belly without you knowing and it's staying there. And that for me was really hard because it was like I have this thing inside my belly still. I have this baby inside my belly and it's still there, but it's dead inside me. That's It's a really hard idea to, to grasp and to just come to terms with. I did have a few friends that had gone through a similar thing. And so I took a lot of comfort from talking to them about their experience. And likewise, my, it, it's still, even then it's hard. You still don't talk about it in huge detail. I couldn't share this level of detail with people at the time. There's no way. This is the kind of thing that can destroy marriages. And it must be very difficult for a man to wrap their head around what this means. As you said, you're still carrying this baby. The, the fetus is still there during those two weeks while you were wanting to let nature take its course. How did he come to terms with this, if you can speak for him? Yeah, look, he's he has a scientific background. So he right. studied sciences, biology, and so his approach to it was very scientific. It wasn't meant to be there was an issue, we can try again at some point in time, you're okay, you're healthy, we have a daughter. I think at the time it was really hard and it did put a lot of pressure on our relationship at the time because I was grieving. I think he was grieving but I couldn't see his grief because he was covering it with this scientific analysis and the scientific analysis was doing nothing for me either from my doctor or from my husband and I was like I don't need to hear this I know this I'm intelligent I understand why I don't care about the why the why is irrelevant but for him that why was really important because the why is what was anchoring him but I think internally my husband's a pretty sensitive person and I'm sure he was actually in retrospect looking back now mm -hmm. going through a lot internally that he equally was not sharing with me because my grief was too large to accommodate the grief of another person. Right. Yeah. And so we really struggled because at times when we were getting angsty, he would say to me, but I'm grieving too. And I'd be like, but it's different. You don't understand because it's going on in my body and I still feel pregnant, I still look pregnant, I've still got this thing inside me. And so it was really hard. So we butted heads a lot. And in the conversations that I've had since with other women that have gone through these situations, and even some men that have been there with their partners going through these situations, it's it's really it's really hard. I think you go one of two ways. Either you become really close through the loss because you're able to be a support for each other or go the complete opposite direction and you just can't hold each other's grief because you're both grieving and you just can't find a way to meet in the middle. And I think that happens a lot with relationships and you see it as well, not just in these situations, but, you know, when you know, you read stories of parents who've lost children when they're older and it's not uncommon for relationships to break down mm -hmm. after those tragic events. And 
I think it's a very similar thing after you've lost an unborn child because you both have these separate and collective dreams, what this child's going to be like. Mm -hmm. And with having a daughter, for me, it was the dreams of her playing with her sibling and, and that joy and those memories that she'd be creating with this with this new child in our lives and so I'm sure my husband had similar dreams Mm -hmm. and similar thoughts and hopes but neither of us could just could see it from the other person's perspective at the time it took me coming out of it probably took me coming out of my grief from that whole year of dealing Mm -hmm. with the two losses and potentially even after having my son to be able to look back and go do you know, I, was, I wasn't there for him either during that period. He was trying to be there for me in the way that he thought best. He was probably suffering as well, but I, I couldn't hold space for him at the time. And you had a third pregnancy and, again, lost that baby. Yeah. And the process was more brief but no less deep and horrific to go through. And then decided to have one last try. This was like, okay, this is it. We're going to try this again. But it was very difficult to be that joyful pregnant woman with the the son who was ultimately born and and is living to to, to try and put aside those feelings of dread and anxiety. Yeah, really hard. I was anxious, I think, for my entire pregnancy with my son. I didn't enjoy a moment of it. It was literally, I found out I was pregnant and at this, instead of the joy that I'd felt in the second pregnancy, the one before any miscarriages had happened, it was very much, oh, okay, all right, we're pregnant. Oh, sigh, okay, all right, let's see what happens now. And it's very much you go into it with the worst expectations Mm -hmm. rather than with joy. And so I tried to not allow myself to dream. I tried to stop myself from thinking about the future we definitely did not tell our daughter either in the third or the fourth pregnancy so we didn't tell her until quite a bit later because I was like I just can't can't deal with that again it was really hard and then even when we got past the first trimester and told people it was still really hard because I was like people would come up to me and be like oh congratulations are you pregnant how exciting and I'd be like okay thank you be like now it's real like now it's out there that I'm pregnant now what happens if I lose a baby and so for me it was even post that period where the chances go down of you losing the baby I still like I'm gonna somehow lose this baby it's not gonna happen the world is conspiring against me this is just not gonna happen I cannot hold on to any hope whatsoever and so all the way through till the end of the pregnancy and until I actually hold him, it was like something is going to go wrong. And towards the end I had complications. He had to be delivered three and a half weeks early. Mm. There was a chance I had a condition towards the end that could potentially affect his heart. So I was like, here you go. It's happening. It's happening. This is what I dreaded all along and it's happening now. And so I, it's really hard. I think this is why I talk about this stuff so much now I think people who haven't been through this grief don't understand the magnitude of the trauma you experience when you're going through these losses but not just when you're going through these losses after the losses it carries forward so with each of my losses the second miscarriage that I had it was a little bit briefer in that I had a DNC straight away and just it was like literally I found out that morning and by the afternoon they'd removed the fetus and I kept going because I was like you know I've been promoted at work I need to keep going I need to I need to impress people at work from a work perspective let's just move on from this and just get on with life and I was traveling and I was recruiting people and all sorts of things at the same time But the trauma was very much there. I was doing all these things, but also on autopilot and collapsing into a mess at home. And so all of my grief would become this avalanche of emotion when I arrived back home. It was like whilst I was taking off my coat 
of being like, okay, now I can take off this mask that I've been wearing all day and just, okay, now I can express what I've been feeling for the mm-hmm. entire day and what I've been holding inside. And that was hard too. And I think I wasn't the nicest of people to be around at the time in my personal life because I was trying to be my normal, usual self at work. And so all of this other side was exploding at home. And, yeah, you just you try and just get through things and keep moving and it really does impact you forever. And I say now, and I say this now to people, that adversity and challenges, tragedy, they make you who you are. And Mm -hmm. I have my personality, my empathy, my compassion has very much been shaped through these experiences and these experiences now inform who I am, what I do and what I'm passionate about now. So there is something that has come out of this that is amazing from a personal perspective. But, yeah, it's just it's so hard when you're going through it. When you're going through it, it's hard to see beyond that fog And it doesn't help for somebody to say, there's a reason this is happening. Oh, exactly. It's the sort of thing. Talk about it now. In that moment, I actually, I don't know that I even needed words. And I say this to people now in these conversations when you're, and I think this is something that in the workplace people have to get better at, is how to hold space for people. Not just in pregnancy loss situations, but in grief situations or with mental health issues or other things that are going on for people. How do you hold space for people? And often I think we try as human beings to fill space with words. There's Mm -hmm. there's a pause. There's silence. We need to fill it. We need to say something. We need to make the person feel better. In most of these situations, there are no words that you can use that are going to help that person feel better. It is just not even within your capability to do it. The best thing I think you can do in that situation is be there in compassionate silence for the person. Obviously, we're in a COVID world now, but in a non-COVID world, that physical touch, hugging someone, touching them to let them know that you're supporting them, that you're there for them without necessarily saying it in words because you don't often need to. That's That to me is more powerful and I think that's what I needed in that time and it's it's something... I don't know. I don't know that the medical profession will ever change in this space. And I think they have to have a a degree of armour around them because they deal with so much as well. They would see so much loss and you have to be a little bit, not desensitised to it, but you have to create a barrier so that it doesn't impact you so deeply as well. Mm -hmm. I can 100% understand that. But I think to some degree in these moments, it would be better to sit in silence with the person. The explanations can come after the fact. Yeah. So I have a ridiculous question. Sure. What event in your life has had the most profound impact on you? Definitely these events, I think, have had the most impact on me. I think it's fundamentally changed the way I look at things. And these experiences have very much shaped who I am and I talk very openly about these things now. I talk very openly about other stuff that's going on in my life. I could not have done that, you know, however many years ago now, four years ago, five years ago. There's no way I would have done any of that. I was known amongst my family, close family, as being someone that just didn't share. I didn't talk about stuff. Not even to my sister, who I had probably the closest relationship to, not to my husband. I just, I, I wouldn't share this stuff. Like there's, there's nothing, there was a big barrier in the way, which I think is partially uh, culturally developed and developed through my upbringing and things like that. It's just not something you, you talk about. Mental health is, it has very much been, I guess, low on the radar in many societies, including Indian society. And so I just wouldn't talk about it. And I think this has fundamentally shifted my approach to life 
And now people will say to me, "How, oh my God, you're so vulnerable. How can you be so vulnerable? And I'm like, it's funny what tragedy does to you. Mm-hmm. What does it mean to live a courageous life? I think to live a courageous life for me means talking about your truth and standing for the things that you believe in. I wrote something the other day on LinkedIn. I had written this post about a month and a half ago about about my daughter asking me about gender pronouns. I think she'd been looking at a photo I'd put on LinkedIn and she saw the she, her after my name and she's, Mom, Mommy, what's this about? Why do people put these pronouns these things, these words after their name. And so I was like, okay, how do I explain gender, binary, non-binary to you? And so I was explaining it to her. Anyway, afterwards, and she was very accepting of the whole thing. And it's amazing how kids have this ability to just be so accepting and matter of fact, and okay, that makes sense to me. Good. I don't need to ask any questions because it's just their reality is different to the reality that we grew up in and that Mm -hmm. we knew and have been influenced by. And so I wrote this post a month and a bit ago about how I was encouraged by the fact that kids nowadays are able to ask these questions and have these conversations. And I, some of the comments I got back from people who don't believe in gender non-binary were horrific, like just horrific. And I was reflecting on it and I was like, I could literally go, I'm not going to talk about this anymore. And and shy away from that conversation and be like, it's fine. It's not my reality. So do I really need to talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. Or create an excuse not to talk about it. And I reflected on it. I was like, no, do you know, this is important to me, like inclusion, diversity, acceptance of other people, listening, empathy. These are all things that are fundamentally at my core from a values perspective. I'm going to talk about it. And if these people come out and have these views, then so be it. But there's other people out there for whom awareness might grow as a result of me talking about these things. And so for me, living a courageous life is about not not just talking about these things, but taking action, doing things to further your passions, your values, your beliefs, trying to leave the world in a better place, right? Mm. Whatever that little bit that is that I can add to it, that for me is living a courageous life. Which is related to my next question, which is what is your legacy? I think that is my legacy. I think my legacy is two things. I want people to know, looking back, who I was, not what I did. The what I did is a very small part of my life. Yes, you spent a lot of time at work. It's a small part of my life, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, I want my legacy to be about who I am, what I cared about, and the fact that I made a difference somewhere. That's it. And and the word visibility comes to mind in terms of perhaps the previous version of Nitti was less willing to be visible in your grief, in your allowing people to be aware of what you thought or felt, whereas this new version, this sort of cracked open version, is a little more willing to be visible and, and seen and heard. Yeah, it's amazing. I think the leaving aside my miscarriages, I think the pandemic as well Mm -hmm. has really shifted my outlook on on everything, on life, on work, on family, values, everything. And I think for me it has become critical Mm -hmm. for my own personal sense of wholeness to do these things, to talk about these things, to uh, share, to bring awareness to issues that need more awareness around them, and not just pregnancy loss, I think many other things as well. It's become a driving factor and now informs my energy. It's a part of what, yeah, it's just a part of what makes me who I am, which was very different to where I was a few years ago, as I've said before. But And the pandemic is really... I think added to that, it's it's accelerated that journey for me mm-hmm. and really made me very aware of the fact that life is short and if I want to make a difference, 
I can't wait to make a difference. I have to start making a difference now. There's no time to wait or to just sit around and go through the motions and just do what you've always done and think someday I'll do something. And that someday is now. That's wonderful. What would you do on your last day? What would I do on my last day? Spend it with my family, I think. 100% my family, my closest friends, I think, literally gather the people I loved close to me, laugh, eat, drink, have fun, not dwell on the next day that isn't to be, but to really enjoy that last day. Yeah. And if you had the opportunity to have a conversation with someone for five minutes, person could be living or dead, who would that be? Interesting question. Who would I talk to? I don't know. You've stumped me. To you think heard it here, folks. I stumped a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> you did indeed. No, I'm struggling. I don't know. Oh, hang on. Maybe if there is one person, I think Buddha is oh. who I would talk to. So I'm not religious at all. My parents are not very religious at all. My dad says he has no religion, but we grew up with Hinduism and we're very much encouraged to learn about everything and to absorb everything and to make our own choices in life about what we choose to believe in and what we don't choose to believe in. And so for me, when I grew up and when I started traveling, I was mesmerized when I was in Vietnam by the temples over there. And this feeling I got when I was in those places was unlike a feeling I've had in any other religious venue, any temple or church or anything. I just felt overwhelmed by this just sense of peace and just comfort. It was just, yeah, it was like being enveloped in a big hug when I was sitting in these temples. And so for me, I think the principles of Buddhism, which isn't so much a religion as a way of believing, are beautiful. And I think the things that he stands for or stood for are phenomenal. And if we could live our lives in the way that he said we should, then the world would be a very different place. So I think if I could have a conversation, I think it would be with Buddha. And what would you ask? Oh, what would I ask? Now you've stumped me again. Now I don't know. I think I would ask perhaps what drew him to live his life the way he did and how, how another human being could do the same thing. What are the steps that a person needs to take to reach that level of enlightenment and be able to live with harmony, I guess, is the word, perhaps. Yeah, so I think that's what I would ask. And look, I think I'm, I'm realistic in the sense that I'm never going to live that life. That's never going to be my life. And the modern trappings of the world nowadays are they're very different, right? We're surrounded by all sorts of different stimuli to what were around at the time the Buddha was around. So I think you know, it's a different world. But I think there's so much in in meditation, in doing some of the things or espousing some of the beliefs that he had in your daily life that can bring you so much more peace and harmony. And I see it even now with just the way I've shifted myself in the last two years. I feel more grounded than I've ever done before. I feel more at peace than I've ever done before. And I think some of that is you starting to live out your values. And that compassionate silence that you spoke about earlier as really the balm for the intense grief that someone might be feeling is certainly something that through my own meditation practice, I think is really something that if we can learn that, we don't have to fix it. We don't have to try and figure out, like you say, the right words. Sometimes it's just that yeah. compassionate silence that is that is so powerful. It is indeed. And I think even beyond situations of grief, I think if you think about even in workplace settings, mm-hmm. meetings, things like that, everyone has this need to jump in with words. If we let people speak, 
and allowed the silence to sit for a bit. You, you hear more through those silences and people share more, more through those silences. And I talk about this in the diversity and inclusion space as well and I think it's another area where, you know, when we're, we're thinking about how to solve these issues, I think the first step is really this listening piece, allowing mm. people to speak and not jumping in with solutions and what's next. But just let's first just truly understand where these people are at. Let's not make assumptions because I think otherwise we make assumptions and we form views and then we're like on to problem-solving mode and let's go do right? But mm-hmm. before we do, we need to understand. Yeah, most definitely. Is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up? No, I think this has been a wonderful conversation. So I thank you. It's been lovely to chat to you. I, I appreciate you being so willing to share so deeply your experiences and share with my listeners your understanding of your own transformation that's happened along the mm. way and, and how that's influenced you. Thank you very much for you this. Too, and I apologize for the bird. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> this quote from the Buddha seemed appropriate as Nidhi continues to share her story with others so generously. Should someone do good, let them do it again and again. They should develop this habit for the accumulation of goodness brings joy. I wish you much joy, Nitti. Thank you for listening. If you feel someone else needs to hear this story, please share it on your social media or directly through email. If you have any questions or comments, please reach out via the website, www.thearena-podcast.com. I look forward to sharing my next guest story of wanting to grow up to become a police officer, to be able to arrest abusive men like his father. He did that and so much more. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in The Arena.